loose box and I looked over in the loose box and there was this other one and I said to him I says what's this one he says that's one of the litter sisters he says but she says it was a beggar for fighting he says with them all so he says I've managed to catch that one before you've come and I've shut it in there so I said to him well I'm not going back without that so I'll take that and I had a shock of my life when I asked it I said I said what do you want for him and he says, well, I'm, I'll be that glad to get shut of him, he says. If you could bring me 25 quid, you can have it. And the biggest mistake I ever made in my life was I didn't buy the lot. Because if I could have caught the other two, George, I'd have took the lot. But I couldn't catch the buggers. One Sunday afternoon at Dyke Nuke Quarries near Hebden Bridge in Yorkshire, two Border Lakeland Cross Terriers, Champ and Pip, went underground chasing foxes. Champ surfaced after two hours, but Pip did not come when called. By seven o'clock, it was pitch black, and they marked the entrance to the earth, um, and Steve Lutty, who was Pip's owner, left his coat by the earth as a scent marker. They came back the next morning at 5.30, Monday morning, and they could still hear the dog um, baiting in the earth, and they dug until it was time to go to work, and they came back after work and dug again until dusk. Steve contacted the Fell and Moreland Terrier Club and they dug again on Wednesday and Thursday, but with no result. They could still hear the dog, but by this time, of course, she was getting weaker. On Friday, they were joined by the Fell and Moreland area rep, Chris Houghton. Together they got within 18 inches of the bitch, whose bark was weaker after five days trapped below ground. Large boulders and darkness stopped further progress. On Saturday, the three original terrier men were joined by more volunteers and began moving boulders with a turfer and bars. After several hours of back-breaking work, the heartening sight of Pip's face was seen by torchlight through a small crack in the rocks. There's some open there, alright. Can you see down More stone was removed and Pip, trapped for six days, was rescued from certain death. Good lass, come on. Come on, Pip. Good lass, come on. Come on, lass. Good lass. Yeah. Good girl. Good girl. Yeah, Pip. Yeah. Come on, Pip. Moments after the men were leaving the rescue site, there was a large fall of rock behind them. Bloody really hell. That was close. <laughs> oh, dear. Someone smiled on them that day. In all, some hundred tons of rocks were moved to rescue Pip. Steve and all the men on the dig had nothing but praise for Rep Chris Houghton and the Fell and Moreland Club for the organization of the rescue, and especially from Steve for the saving of his friend's life. Pip, she was given food and water and quickly recovered. The following day, she was back at work doing a bit of rabbiting. <laughs> Another pip, this time a red foal terrier bitch, became stuck on a narrow ledge 30 feet from the top of a cliff face in Snowdonia after chasing a hunted fox. Frank Riley, himself a terrier man, was lured by rope to attempt the rescue. There was a 50-foot sheer drop below to the rocks.
He's got the dog! Although the arduous task of removing rock or digging was not needed, Frank from the Fell and Moreland Club carried out the rescue in a professional and effective manner. This unassuming man, as many of them are, was warmly congratulated by Pip's owner, Alan Owen, the master and huntsman of the Nant Cole Valley Foxhounds. Actually, what happened yesterday, Alan? Ah, we were How did the terrier come to get down there, like, or get there? Ah, we were hunting up on that bit of rough ground up there, and uh, we had a fox on the ground, and he, we bolted him, and he went headlong down that crag, and the little terrier got excited, and she went down after the hounds. These were just two of the rescues carried out by the Fell and Moreland Terrier Club all over the country. Generally accepted as one of the best breed of terrier, the original Lakeland Terrier has existed in the Lake District for centuries. In the last hundred years, the working Lakeland and show Lakeland have split and now show a marked difference. Fell, Patterdale and Black Terriers are all names given to descendants of the working Lakeland, but they are mostly all called Fell Terriers. To withstand the hard winters and the harsh terrain of the fells, they need sufficient length of leg to negotiate rocks and a harsh, dense, weather-resistant coat. The legendary Mr. Cyril Bray, a schoolmaster of Kirby Lonsdale, Westmoreland, was one of the most noted and respected breeders of working terriers in the last hundred years. He's on the right of this photo with Rusty, one of his finest terriers. Wally Wilde is on the left with Kipper, Rusty's brother. Frank Buck from Leyburn, North Yorkshire, an associate of Mr. Bray, continued the line. The line from Mr. Bray's Rusty and Frank Buck's Tex still produce excellent dogs. When you first started with terriers, who was the terrier, ma terrier man or men who you looked up to? Or in other words, who were the best terrier men in them days? Well. Definitely the two best terrier breeders that I've ever come across in my time was definitely Mr. Bray and probably Frank, Frank Buck II. John Parks has fell terriers that he originally bought from Frank Buck. Mr. Bray got one, they called it Bonnie, which he later gave to me. And Monty, the dog I wanted as a pup, Frank had got it and he'd actually sold it as a pup. Mm. Anyway. He sold it, and I thought, bloody hell, I desperately wanted that dog. You know, when someone appears to you and you want it, when you're a lad like you, you're wanting it. Yeah, it took your eye. And uh, anyway, once after the morning, phone rung, and Frank rings up. He says, I've got your dog back. I said, I've got Monty back. He says, one minute, God, it's died. So, now no more to do. I says, right, I'll be up. And I went straight up to Laban. I push back in again. No, no, no motor car. No, no, motor car no. And I set off in motor car and I went straight up there and Ivy were going shopping. And I'll never forget it, I had the Illman Super Minx car and had a, his master's voice. First one at mm. first, not a valve radio, first, you know, one with. And it's playing up back window. And Ivy says, bah, it's a good tone, that wireless. And thought no more about it. Goes it house and you're all as welcome at books, they're all as summer tea, you know. And you, we went in and anyway, Ivy went shopping after a bit, she come back and we had dinner and I'd get the dog. Anyway, it come to going like three or four o'clock time and 
Ivy says, do you want to sell that lady? I said, well, I says, how much is the dog? So Frank says, 12 quid. So I says, I'll swap you at wireless for the dog. And they got on the wireless, and that wireless was still going when Frank Book died. <laughs> <laughs> That's as true as I'm studying. Yeah. Maurice Bell is a sheep farmer and master and huntsman of the Wensleydale. He kennels hounds on his farm in the beautiful but sometimes inhospitable terrain of the Wensleydale Hills. Oh, I like uh, a natural fell terrier. I don't care what colour they are, whether they're red, black, or tan. Uh, uh. This, this old bitch here, she's. That my type of terrier. She's, she's a hard jacket. She's not too big. She's uh, actually she won't you off your show when she was three or four years in, but I mean uh, my daughter took her, I didn't take her. I'm not a sure man. But uh, my uh, they must work for me. They're no good, I don't I don't care what they look like, they must work. I have a young dog now, a young black and now. It's no to look at, but absolutely unbelievable. She's just what I like in a working career. But uh, I don't like them too big, I don't like them too broad. They want to be on a bit of leg, as long as they're not too wide. Mm -hmm. But uh, what's suitable for my type of country? Because when they're hunting up here, they have to go all day on couplings, and it's, it's a hard job. They travel through ling, briar, bracken, and when it's snow, they're up to belly in snow all day and ice. Mm -hmm. They've got to be tough. But a jacket is essential. They must have a hard jacket. No good these smooth coatings, and these with a lot of jacket. They get these with a lot of jacket going to a peat hole, and they come out absolutely balled up to the food ever to starve before long. <laughs> I've had them an awful lot of years. I mean, I, uh, we've kept the same type of terrier and tried to keep them, but you know, you've got to put a bit of a fresh, a bit of fresh blood in. Um, a dog we used was, was Harry Hardesty Turk. He was a famous dog in them days. A good work dog, worked with Melrick Foxhound, and everybody seemed to want to put some turk blood. Well, put some turk blood in them, but it's a long way back, a long way back. These terriers they used to wall, they get over walls, they get over fences, and uh, some of places, you know, they, they just, they, that's, the, that's the job, they're bred for work, and that's, that's what they, they enjoy doing. I'm a very, very fair man. I, I'm not a cruel man, maybe lots of people think I am, but I'm not. I like, to, I like to treat them well, they say, well, you know, when they get old, you just put them down. We have an old sheep dog, he's just, he's just died this spring. He was 18 year old, and our Wendy's old Ross would well, be about 16 year old. This is eight year old, and maybe her best working days are over. But I think the world of them, mm -hmm. there's no way she's going to be put down. She'll stay up here unless she starts suffering. But uh, they're friends, they work for you, they do the best for you. So you're nothing you look after them. Ken Gould is a well known breeder of black terriers. Is the black dog. We didn't th seem to throw the pups that the black dog did, you know. Yeah. Russells are a lot harder to breed than black dogs, I think. Black dogs are a different animal. Yeah. Modern technology has come to the aid of terrier men trying to locate their dogs below ground. Terrier man Jim McIver fits a locator collar containing a lightweight transmitter around his dog's neck. It sends a bleeping signal to a handheld receiver fitted with a gauge, which indicates the position of the dog and allows the terrier man to plot its movement below grounds. It has a range of about 15 feet. Master and huntsman Mark Hankinson also takes the opportunity to brief the terrier man on where permission has been given to dig. Fox has gone to ground here, so all the exits from the earth are blocked. Some with stones, some with nets. <laughs> 